వెల్కమ్ టు ది ఎన్ఏఓ పీజీ పాఠశాల ఆన్లైన్ పీజీ టీచింగ్ ప్రోగ్రామ్ అండ్ యాజ్ వెల్ యాజ్ కంబైండ్ విత్ వాట్సాప్ పీజీ గురుకులం ఐ వెల్కమ్ ఆల్ ది ఫ్యాకల్టీ of uh, attending today's uh, 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 talk by Dr. Jayan Sampad, sir. And then uh, we thank Artho TV for, uh, for, their, for uh, recording this, uh, for their active participation recording this, uh, uh, our meeting. And also welcome all other faculty and all the students participating today. Now it's my pleasant duty to introduce Dr. Jayant Sundar Sampat, FRCS and, uh, in Trauma and Ortho, is a consultant pediatric and pediatric orthopedic surgeon in Rainbow Children's Hospital, Martha Harley, Bangalore. Change the website. Uh, he, is a, he is a full-time pediatric orthopedic surgeon, completed his orthopedic training from Manchester, UK in 2002. Pediatric Orthopedic Fellowships from Del DuPont Hospital for Children, Wilmington, Delaware, USA, and Boothwall Hall Children's Hospital, Manchester, 2002-2004. And consultant Pediatric Orthopedic Center at Order H Children's Hospital, Liverpool, from 2004-2010. Then he returned to India, and now he is settled in Bangalore. At present, he is in Bangalore. and he is manages all pediatric orthopedic conditions and children fractures special interests are cerebral palsy neuromuscular disorders and gait analysis he established first clinical gait lab in bangalore in 2013 editor of international journal of pediatric orthopedics and also executive member of posi and he has his credit 25 publications and several book chapters in national and international level now i welcome dr jayanth sampath to proceed with this talk thank you sampath sir please proceed with your talk now thank you very much uh, pleasure to talk about gait it's a matter that um, close to my heart um, and i've been um, i've learned from masters um, and in turn i feel it is my duty to pass on whatever little i know um, to the next generation of orthopedic surgeons so we will start with share the share your screen sir yeah i think everyone can see the screen yes sir yes sir so uh, this is a talk the first talk is about um, the phases of uh, normal gait uh, and the slides and the animation uh, i have borrowed from dr deeran ganjwala uh, he has an excellent he's an excellent animator and uh, illustrator and um, i really can't do any better than what dr deeran has done with these animations so with his permission i'm using his slides um because gait needs to be uh, is better understood when 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 things are animated uh, he is the current uh, president of the pediatric orthopedic society of india uh, he is a great pediatric orthopedic surgeon and an inspiration to everyone so so the gait cycle um is all the events that happen from foot contact to when the foot contacts the ground again so all the events that happen from foot contact to foot contact constitutes one gait cycle all of us know that uh, one gait cycle is again divided into two uh, parts the first part is the stance phase of gait when the foot is in contact with the ground and the next part is the swing phase of the gait when the foot is off the ground and we should also understand that um the gait cycles of the two limbs the right and left lower limbs are not do not occur at the same time and there is a slight uh, difference in timing of the two otherwise we would be hopping so in order to give this sort of reciprocal gait there is a very uh, carefully coordinated timing and interplay between the gait cycle of the right and left lower limbs so here we have put the two gait cycles of the right limb and 
the left lower limb side by side and we can see that there are specific periods of overlap when the stance phase of both lower limbs coincide so these are called double support periods when uh, both right and left legs are in contact with the ground so after the first double support period there is a period when the contralateral limb goes into swing and this is called a single leg support and then again before the right leg can go into swing the left leg obviously has to come back and reach the ground and you have one more double support period called the terminal double support period so you have an initial double support a single leg support and a terminal double support period so if we uh, look at uh, the gait cycle now we have initially we started with stance and swing then we have divided stance into three sub uh, groups the initial double support period is called loading response so these are all technical terms that we need to learn and remember so the initial double support period is called loading response and the terminal double support period is called pre swing so pre pre swing because it is the period that immediately precedes swing and that makes intuitive sense the single leg stance is divided again into two periods called mid stance and terminal stance so mid stance is when the weight acceptance proceeds and the body basically reaches over the stance phase limb and as the body weight crosses the uh, midline in the sagittal plane then it goes into terminal stance and after that we go into pre swing initial swing mid swing and terminal swing are the three phases of the swing phase of gait and that depends on where the swinging phase leg is in relation to the stance phase limb so when the swinging phase initially it will start behind yeah so that's called the trailing limb so trailing limb is initial swing and then as it crosses the layer, the, the opposite leg it's called mid swing and then once it crosses the 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 stance phase limb it it becomes the leading limb right so um and swing and stance phase have two different purposes the purpose of swing phase is to advance the limb yeah it advances the limb so that you can take the next step the purpose of stance phase is to advance the body over the planted limb i hope that's clear so stance phase is all to do with advancing the body over the stance phase limb and the purpose of swing is to advance the leg yeah so they serve two different uh, mutually uh, sort of mutually coordinated uh, purposes so to look at stance phase we um stance phase includes all the events that happen from initial contact until foot off until the foot leaves the ground we have seen that it comprises of four phases loading response mid stance terminal stance and pre swing in the same way swing phase starts from foot off until the initial contact of the same leg and as we have seen there are three parts initial mid and terminal swing so let's look at each of these subdivisions in detail and find out what exactly happens so loading response is basically the first phase of the gait cycle when the limb touches the ground and the body weight is accepted the uh, the weight of the body is accepted by the leg so we know from newton's third law that whenever there is some contact between two objects as the object contacts uh, a contacts b b will exert an equal and opposite force yeah so every action has a equal and opposite reaction so just as our body touches the ground the ground applies an equal and opposite force back to the body this is called the ground reaction force and loading response 
is the body's response to that ground reaction force because that ground reaction force has to be accepted by the body so the loading response the body prepares to accept this ground reaction force so it begins with initial contact so we used to call this heel strike but we know that not everyone um strikes the ground first heel first yeah so we call this initial contact because in some people it may be a heel strike in some people it may be foot flat some people may land on the forefoot they can you can land on any part of the foot so instead of calling heel strike we call it initial contact and heel strike is one of the one of the types of initial contact is heel strike there are other types of initial contact also so this is as we saw the first period of double support and this has to do with weight acceptance by the body it normally begins with heel strike but other patterns are also possible and as i mentioned there is a ground reaction force and this ground reaction force is passing posterior to the ankle joint during loading response and at this phase of the gait cycle the tibialis anterior is working eccentrically in order to prevent rapid plantar flexion of the foot yeah so there is eccentric activity of the tibialis anterior to prevent rapid plantar flexion that's that's when you get the slapping foot yeah you, know, you get a foot drop key so here the ground reaction force as you can see is passing posterior to the ankle and the tibialis anterior is working eccentrically to gradually allow the foot to land gently on the ground and the foot landing gently on the ground that is a passive movement which is controlled by the eccentric activity of tibialis anterior this first phase that is called the first rocker of gait so first rocker of gait is passive plantar flexion of the ankle controlled by eccentric action of the tibialis anterior the second is mid stance yeah during mid stance the leg is fully on the ground the foot is fully on the ground now and the weight is moving over the planted leg and this as you can see is a passive dorsiflexion of the ankle on the planted foot this is called a closed chain kinetic movement if pgs don't know about open and closed chain kinetic movements you must go and read this yeah and understand the difference between open and closed chain movements um physiotherapists are taught in detail about open and closed chain unfortunately orthopedic uh, syllabus we don't deal with it so much at least in the days i was a pg we didn't we were we weren't really taught about the differences between open and closed chain but i think it's very important for uh, when we understand uh, kinematics and when we understand kinesiology um, i think it's important to understand these differences so this, so this is also the period of the second rocker of gait when the foot is when the ankle when the body is moving forward over the planted foot and it is a passive dorsiflexion of the ankle and this is the time at which the center of mass of the body reaches the highest point and this is called the zenith yeah the center of mass of the body reaches the highest point so during the uh, mid stance there is progressive hip extension by the gluteus maximus which is a powerful uh, hip extensor the knee is also extending progressively but this knee extension is a passive movement whereas the hip extension that happens is an active movement the knee extension is a passive movement and as we saw the ankle is passively dorsiflexing and any passive dorsiflexion that's happening has to be controlled by the opposite muscle just like in the first rocker of gait passive plantar flexion was controlled by tibialis anterior eccentric action passive dorsiflexion will be controlled by eccentric action of the soleus otherwise you'll get a sudden rapid dorsiflexion without control and this is called the second rocker of gait so we saw the first rocker the second rocker so this is a passive dorsiflexion of the ankle the tibia is moving forwards on the planted foot and this is being controlled by the passive by eccentric contraction of the soleus which breaks the sudden passive movement of the tibia so there is eccentric action of soleus and when there is eccentric action of soleus it basically pulls the tibia back and allows the ground reaction force now to pass anterior to the knee the minute the ground reaction force passes anterior to the knee 
even without any active quadriceps activity, the knee will be passively extended. So just by so this is an energy conservation energy conservation mechanism of the body by which just by using the ground reaction force, the body is able to get work done without wasting um, energy, without wasting ATP. Yeah, and there are many such energy conservation mechanisms that happen during normal gait. So this is a period of energy conservation. The center of mass is at its highest point, which is called the zenith. And when you have someone who is, uh, who is not able to um, have good soleus action and pull the, pull the tibia back and allow the ground reaction force to pass anterior to the knee. So there is, um, so this is a child who has got crouch gain. Here, there should be, there has to be a lot of excessive activity of the quadriceps in order to maintain the body weight against, um, against gravity or else the child will collapse down to the ground. So in children with crouch gait, they lack the ability to be able to get this passive knee extension in mid stance. So let's move on to terminal stance. So here the body is getting prepared to get the uh, foot off the ground and move into swing phase. So here the, the uh, center of mass has reached the zenith and it is moving forwards. So it's going down to its lowest point and this is called the nadir, the lowest point. So here the gastrosoleus is still working to prevent further forward progression of the tibia like this and therefore just by the soleus action the rocker shifts from the tibia to the metatarsal. So there is a smooth progression from the second rocker to the third rocker of gait. So here we have the first rocker, then you have the second rocker, and then the soleus breaks the tibia, and then automatically you go into third rocker. So this is another way of smoothly controlling how the segments of the body are able to progress from one phase to the next. Let's move on to the last phase of the um, stance, which is the pre-swing. So let's see what's happening in, in swing. So now during pre-swing, this is the terminal double support phase. So the opposite leg has already come and touched the ground so that this leg can leave the ground. So this is the terminal double support phase. Opposite leg has reached the ground and the ipsilateral limb is getting ready for swing. And the weight is shifted to the opposite side so that the ipsilateral limb can move into swing. And this is the phase at which the gastrosoleus propels the body. And this is the powerful push-off. So 50 to 60% of power generation that happens during normal gain happens during the during this phase, during the terminal stance and pre-swing. So it accounts for 50% of propulsive. So let's move on to, uh, so it's a very important, so pre-swing is a very important uh, phase because that's what gives you the push of power to be able to move the body forwards. So let's look at the phases of swings. We saw that there were three parts, namely initial swing, mid swing, and terminal swing. During initial swing, there is flexion of the hip. And we know that um, flexion of the hip, so we will look at the muscle action. So there is a rapid swinging of the limb, which provides the propulsive force. And this um, rapid hip flexion is powered by concentric contraction of the iliosoas, the gracilis, and the anterior hip adductors, all three muscles work together to flex the hip up. So it's at one more power stroke that happens during gait. And knee flexion is controlled by the short head of biceps only. The reason only short head of biceps works is it is the only muscle that does not cross the hip. All the other hamstring muscles cross the hip. So if the other hamstrings work, this is a phase when hip has to flex. But the, we know that the hamstrings are accessory hip extensors. So you want to, the body doesn't want the other hamstrings to work. It wants only the, the um, single joint hamstring muscle, which is the short head of biceps to work at this time. So body switches off, the, the brain switches off the other hamstrings so that hip flexion can happen smoothly along with knee flexion. At this time, because it's a swing phase of gait, you want the foot to clear the ground. So the tibialis anterior works concentrically to dorsiflex the ankle so that the foot does not 
touch the ground and you get good ground clearance. So we have the uh, hip flexors, the iliosovus, the gracilis and the anterior hip adductors that are working to flex the hip up and the short head of biceps that works to flex the knee and the uh, tibialis anterior to dorsiflex the hand. So let's move on to the next phase, which is mid swing here. The trailing limb is crossing the, the stance phase limb and moving ahead of the stance phase limb now. So this is a passive movement that is happening. There is minimal muscle activity because already by, um, by rapid and powerful contraction of the iliosovus, the, uh, the momentum has already been given to the swing phase leg. So now it is just carrying through. Yeah, it's just carrying through. It is like an arrow that is in mid-flight. Yeah, think of an arrow that is in mid-flight. The archer has already given the power to the arrow at the time he released it from the bow. So if you see, look at an arrow in mid-flight, it's moving. Yeah, it still has momentum, but nothing is pushing it. The momentum has already been given to it at the point it was released from the bow. So the swing face limb that is in mid-swing is like an arrow that is in mid-flight. So the tibialis anterior continues to add to keep the foot in dorsiflexion flying. Yeah, think of an arrow that is in mid-flight. Now move on. The archer is swing. Already the given the power to the leg is getting ready to go back and touch the ground again. So this is the uh, complementary phase to the pre-swing. So pre-swing is a stance phase event where the limb is getting ready for swing. And terminal swing is a swing phase event where the limb is getting ready for stance. I hope that distinction is clear. But these are basically opposite sides of the same coin. So here there is um, extension of the knee so that the um, uh, limb can go and touch the ground again, ideally in heel strike. So how does this knee extension happen? It happens by transferring the momentum that was given to the hip and then what the and then the hamstrings work. So when the hamstrings work eccentrically, we know that they are hip extensors. So it breaks the hip flexion. So when hip flexion is is breaked suddenly, the knee is acting as a compound pendulum, and the excess force that is remaining, the momentum is remaining, is just transferred to the leg, and the knee passively extends. Yeah. So this is another energy conservation mechanism that happens. So the hip is flexing and then the hamstrings break and then the knee naturally extends. So just to summarize, we have two main periods of the gait cycle, stance and swing. Stance has to do with weight acceptance and single limb support. Swing has to do with limb advancement. So weight acceptance is initial contact and loading response. Single limb support is mid stance, terminal stance, and part of pre swing. And limb advancement is accomplished through initial swing, mid swing, and terminal swing. So I just want to go through some um, uh, concepts regarding uh, prerequisites of uh, normal gait. And these were introduced by Dr. Jacqueline Perry. Dr. Jacqueline Perry is a, um, uh, is a one of the founding figures of modern gait analysis. She worked in um, Rancho Los Alamos um, gait lab. She was the pioneers and she's unique in that she was a physiotherapist. And then uh, after starting practice as a physiotherapist, she realized that her true calling was in orthopedics. So she went back to medical school, completed her medical school, orthopedic residency training, and then did her pediatric orthopedic fellowship so she is a one of those rare uh, people who is a dual qualified physiotherapist and a very good pediatric orthopedic surgeon. And I had the opportunity to meet Madam in uh, uh, the USA in 2002, 20 years ago, uh, and she was already in her 90s then. And um, she was kind enough to come and attend one of the gait analysis conferences, and I met her in person uh, during that time. So, um, so Dr. Jacqueline Perry was the one who. Uh, define these five prerequisites of gait. First is proper pre-positioning of the foot. The foot should land in the correct place. You should have adequate step length. You should have good clearance of the limb and swing. 
there should be stability in stance and there should be energy conservation of gait so these five prerequisites are very important for us for our gait to be normal and if any of these five aspects is affected uh, by disease uh, or injury then obviously that will have an adverse impact on our overall gait pattern so i just uh, always put this slide in uh, these are the um, current um, luminaries in the field of cerebral palsy and uh, gait analysis um, and these are my teachers and uh, i would like to just mention them um, uh, that uh, ultimately we oh all we all what we know to our teachers and we should never forget them so if uh, there are no questions i can move on to the next uh, part of the talk uh, uh thank you sir it is a a master the exposition of this uh, gait analysis in each and every details have been touched upon i am sure that uh, our pg sir uh, really fortunate to listen to this normal gait analysis gait analysis and uh, just i would one question sir uh, yes. how do you define this gait sir suppose somebody asks in the examination how do we define the gait for the examiners So there are any number of definitions are given, but uh, uh, please give a, a, a easy and simplest uh, gait gay, gay definition, sir. So, um, if a person is walking normally, yeah. So the best way to describe it is as a reciprocal heel toe gait with appropriate cadence and normal speed. Yeah. Okay. So if you just use that single sentence. then it basically says that you have looked at and analyzed all the different aspects of the gait and found them all to be normal so reciprocal means stance follow swings follow stance follow swing that's called reciprocal gait heel toe means the the person is touching heel first and then pushing off with the toe yeah so okay. reciprocal heel toe gait with appropriate cadence cadence means number of steps taken per minute and that is a very important uh, indicator of gait so reciprocal heel toe gait with appropriate cadence and normal walking speed we uh, adults typically walk at a speed of 1.2 meters per second obviously we can't use a stopwatch and all that and calculate this um you know in an exam but the human brain our own brain when we see a person walking normally we have an internal mechanism by which we can perceive that that is a normal gait yeah so um i think it has to do with our own evolution wherein uh when we see another human being walking um we are we want to assess to see whether they are uh they are going to come and uh, hit us or whether they are whether we are physically superior or inferior to them and it i think it also has to do with uh, selecting a, a healthy partner uh, and these i think our own we have gait analysis circuits in our own brain so yes, yes. we use these circuits uh, unconsciously but whenever we see someone who is not walking normally even a lay person who has absolutely no uh, sort of uh, expertise or knowledge he can say ah <laughs> there is something wrong so every human being has a inherent inbuilt gait analysis circuit in our brain by which we are able to say normal from abnormal that much gait analysis circuit we have as orthopedic surgeons all we are doing is to look at it more uh, systematically and use appropriate terminology to describe the various things that's all so yeah. it is only the description that i think as orthopedic surgeons we are different to a layman but even a layman can tell whether the child is walking you know whether a human being is walking normally or not so that basic gait analysis circuit is we we come inbuilt with that uh, thank you so much sir for the benefit of the post graduates i will repeat this what sir has said So reciprocal heel to gait with the appropriate cadence and with normal walking speed. That's what uh, one has to easiest and simple definition of 
gate thank you sir so the next um there are some gate patterns like short limb gate and uh, uh you have trendelenburg gate uh, etc uh, but these you will see short limb gate and trendelenburg gate you will uh, you will see you know after the lurch all this you will see in your general orthopedic practice in your medical colleges you know orthopedic patients will have all these problems but i want to deal with uh, certain special gait patterns that happen in cerebral palsy and these are gait patterns that you may not have heard of and uh, this won't be part of the standard orthopedic curriculum so i thought i will touch upon some uh, special gait patterns in cp uh, so that so as to um, supplement your um, existing knowledge and understanding yes sir <laughs> um you are seeing my screen yes sir yes sir great so um we look at the prerequisites of gait and the classic gait patterns in cp um this we have seen gait cycle is foot contact to foot contact and this slide also you are familiar with now loading response mid stance terminal stance pre swing initial swing mid swing and terminal swing this should just you know if you if your professor wakes you up at 2 o'clock in the morning you should just roll out this yeah you should get this uh, ease of um, saying the different phases of the gait cycle it should just roll off your tongue and we looked at dr perry's five prerequisites of gait stability in stance clearance in swing adequate step like appropriate prepositioning of the foot and reduce energy cost yeah so these five prerequisites of gait again it should just roll out it should just roll out of your tongue with ease so practice all these things because then when examiners ask you about these things if you if you have a certain confidence then obviously examiners are are impressed and they know that uh, you know you are aware of the stuff so there are as you know there are two uh, major types of cerebral palsy first is bilateral cerebral palsy or cerebral or we call this spastic diplegia and then you have unilateral cerebral palsy uh, which is called spastic hemiplegia yeah these are the two main topographical patterns of cerebral palsy that we see in walkers we also have quadriplegia but many children with quadriplegia may not be able to walk so we do not really describe uh, gait patterns in quadriplegia we mainly describe it in diplegia and hemiplegia bilateral cerebral palsy and unilateral cerebral palsy so professor kerr graham and roda in 2004 they published this uh, classification which is looking at the gait patterns in spastic diplegia in the sagittal plane looking at the child from the side yeah so they categorized it into four groups with a fifth fifth group added just to say that the two sides are asymmetric right and left sides are different but primarily there are four groups group 1 is true equinus which means child is walking on the four foot or toes group 2 is jump knee gait so this is a combination of equinus at the ankle plus flexion at the knee so you can see that in group 1 there is equinus at the ankle but the knee is straight in group 2 there is equinus at the ankle but the knee is flexed in group 3 there is no equinus at the ankle the ankle is at 90 degrees but because of knee flexion it looks as though that the ankle is is an equinus so this is therefore called apparent equinus yeah and group 4 is crouch gait where you have excessive dorsiflexion at the ankle associated with knee flexion and hip flexion so let's look at examples of these four types of gait so this is a child you can see that she has got bilateral cerebral palsy and she has true equinus yeah group 1 diplegia and if you look at if you go back and look at the prerequisites of gait um would any of the pgs tell me what are the prerequisites of gait that are affected in this particular girl so does she have stability in stance any of the pgs kindly unmute yourself no so she doesn't she have stability not. so you can see how she is catching on to the wall on both sides so she is very unstable because she is not able to keep the foot flat on the ground does she have clearance in swing 
can you see how her right leg is dragging yeah so she's not having stability in stance she's not having clearance in swing is the pre positioning of the foot correct is she landing heel strike no sir no sir she's landing on the toes and do you think her step length is good so her short leg is significantly reduced yeah and you can see that she's walking very slowly with a energy inefficient gait pattern so a child like this does not meet even one of the five prerequisites of gait so that gives us a strong uh, reasoning for uh, addressing the gait problem so even if a child has some mild abnormality in the gait if the five prerequisites of gait are met there is no need to do any intervention because they are meeting the prerequisites of gait but the minute they fail to meet the prerequisites of gait that's when we have to start looking at what sort of intervention it could be a orthotic it could be physiotherapy it could be surgery it could be anything but some kind of orthopedic intervention is required only when the prerequisites of gait are not met we'll move on to the next which is a jump knee gait pattern so this is another girl with diplegia both legs are affected you can see that in addition to the equinus in the ankle she also has flexion of the knee yeah so this is jump knee gait group 2 hemiplegia there is a 2b pattern where they have extension uh, they have equinus of the ankle but the knee starts off being in flexion but then it moves into hyperextension rekha bottom gait yeah so the rekha bottom gait is called 2b gait pattern and this is an important gait pattern which is apparent equinus so here the ankle is not in equinus it is in neutral the ankle is in neutral but it looks as though the he is in equinus yeah and that is because of excessive knee flexion so it's important not to do any calf lengthening surgery achilles tendon or gastrocnemius lengthening surgery in children with apparent equinus because then you will over lengthen the achilles tendon and push them into crouch gait so this is a problem there is no problem at the ankle yeah even though when you see it looks as though the child is in equinus but the child is not in equinus so therefore this is called apparent equinus so you have to make a distinction between group 2 and group 3 diplegia and this is a very uh, classic gait pattern crouch gait where you have excessive dorsiflexion at the ankle sometimes this is associated with a valgus a planus and valgus deformity of the uh, of the foot associated with excessive hip and knee flexion so this is crouch gait so this is another uh, common gait pattern it's called scissoring gait there are two reasons for scissoring gait in young children this could be because of spasticity in the adductors and in older children it could be because of uh, hip flexion knee flexion associated with hip internal rotation so hip flexion knee flexion and hip internal rotation can also result in a scissoring type gait pattern so this is another common type in cerebral palsy it is called intoeing gait yeah where the foot progression angle is internal normally we have a foot progression angle of 10 to 20 degrees external and this is again a very inefficient pattern because the child finds it difficult to clear the um the swing phase limb over the stance phase limb and they have a tendency to trip up and fall there are two causes of intoeing gait femoral antiversion and internal tibial torsion through a physical examination we can uh, come to a conclusion as to whether the problem is in the femur or tibia and deal with this appropriately by a derotational femoral osteotomy this is another gait pattern which is common it's called stiff knee gait you can see that the knee is not flexing in swing and this again affects clearance so the child has to circumduct the leg so you can see how the child is circumducting at the hip in order to achieve clearance and this is because of spastic rectus femoris it in cerebral palsy because of spastic rectus femoris lack of knee flexion in swing and circumduction gait pattern which is a compensation 
So this is another gate pattern which is called an equinovarus foot deformity. So here you can see that the child is landing on the lateral border of the forefoot and rolling over on the foot. So there is problem with stability in stance, clearance in swing, repositioning of the foot, step length. But this child seems to be walking with a reasonably energy efficient gait pattern. So four of the five prerequisites are affected. So we did some soft tissue releases and tendon transfer. And this is the same child walking three years later. Yeah, this is a after orthopedic surgery. You can see that using a combination of tendon releases and uh, tendon transfers, we can achieve a good functional output. So next, let, let us look at the uh, gait patterns in uh, hemiplegia. So this is where only one limb is affected. And this was described by Dr. Winters in 1987 by Winters, Gage and Hicks. It's called the WGH classification. And again, we have four groups. And let us look at the four groups in turn. Group one is just a foot drop. So this is a problem where in stance phase of gait, the entire foot is in contact with the ground. But in swing phase, the uh, normal dorsiflexion of the uh, ankle that happens does not occur because of weakness of tibialis anterior. So here, only the uh, uh, clearance and swing and the pre-positioning of the foot is affected. Yeah? In, the, in the stance phase, the child is quite stable because the entire foot is in contact with the ground. And a simple way of addressing the problem would be to give a ankle foot orthosis so that the child can clear the ground. Group two is true equinus when there is equinus in stance and swing phase of gait. So both swing and stance phase of gait, the, the, so there is fixed equinus deformity at the ankle. And this more often than not requires some kind of surgical intervention either a calf lengthening or a lengthening of the Achilles tendon. Group 3 is when you have a true equinus plus persistent knee flexion and this is group 3. So here you have to address the problem at the ankle plus you may have to do some kind of uh, intervention at the knee in order to get the knee straight. And group 4 is when you have equinus at the ankle, persistent knee flexion. In addition, you have persistent hip flexion, but also adduction and internal rotation of the femur. And many of these children also have retraction of the heavy pelvis and they also have posturing of the upper limb. So you can see that this child has severe upper limb posturing associated with hip flexion, knee flexion, ankle equinus, and also adduction and internal rotation of the femur. So in summary, when you watch a child walk, first look at the foot progression angle. Is the foot is neutral? Is it out toeing gait or in toeing gait? What are the shoulders like? Is there any shoulder dip? If there is a shoulder dip, there may be a leg leg discrepancy. Any lurch indicates insufficiency of the hip abductors and or hip extensors. Um, you have to look at the pre-positioning of the foot. Look at the knee in the sagittal plane and then you look at the hip and the pelvis. So by systematically looking at the child walking, we can classify the exact gait pattern in children with uh, hemiplegia and diplegia. And uh, based on that, it will guide further management of the child. So any questions? Hello. Uh, hello. Yes. Uh, sir, Udit Kumar, sir. Uh, actually, sir, um, we have a doubt. Sir. Like, uh, what is the difference between lurch and the sway, sir? What is the difference between the lurch and the sway? Go ahead. One of the other professors can answer.
sir it is an excellent analysis of gate term the cp and it is very interesting to see the all the grades sir uh, especially with the uh, videos is a very classical demonstration sir we are very thankful for this and uh, most commonly in the examinations sir uh, the pg examinations uh, most of the examiners they used to ask what is the lurch and what is swaying and when do you see and how do you define this these are the questions commonly they asked in the examinations please clarify all those things for our pgs what is lurch what do you mean by lurch what do you mean by swaying yeah um so lurch is uh, i I'm, i'm not sure i mean i, I don't know if yes. there is some standard uh, answer for it um but um the 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 ways we describe are uh, a lurch is whenever there is a sideways shift of the body uh, yes. because of incompetent hip abductors or when there is a vertical movement of the body which is because of some problem in leg leg discrepancy um yes. sway is not a uh, sway is um, in in gait analysis world we use sway to mean a different thing sway is when you are you are standing and your your body weight is shifting yes. so that is what we call a sway yes. um um so sway is movement of the body when person is standing uh, that's what that is the technical description of sway you know um uh, in the gait analysis community but for pgs it may <laughs> the examiners may want a different answer i'm not sure yes sir so because we use uh, uh, complex software to measure uh, sway um, so yes, we sir. make the child we make the person stand in the middle of the gait lab and then the the system basically uh, creates a, a plot to see how much their body weight is shifting um, so anyway but i think what the examiners might want is might be <laughs> different i don't know they might there might be some standard answer for what is the difference between lurch and sway <laughs> <laughs> so okay. hello anyone knows okay sir hello yes patel sir hello patel sir yes sir sir so can you say something about uh, lurch and swaying oh yes sir told there is a movement of the body either on sir. the side or on the front that is yes. what uh, our professor is tell lurch means on the side sway yes. means uh, the body in static uh, moving mm. after some gait uh, not standing properly or moving the body that is what okay. sway we are, we are told a lurch means uh, it is uh, it may be because of pathology or because of maybe the uh whatever the energy is there then the patient may try to lurch on one side or to compensate the limb he may also lurch so this is what i mean so can it uh, you know i'll yes, go to my next talk yes Hello. sir question okay. ready sir krishna ready sir so okay sir you please continue okay. yeah. so uh, my last uh, talk is on movement analysis in orthopedic decision making so so movement analysis is ubiquitous now in modern life so if you have seen any of uh, these hollywood uh, cgi animation movies all of them use uh, movement analysis and market market tracking technology in order to achieve these special effects uh, if you watched a cricket match um, this is hawkeye which again uses 3d movement analysis technology to track the uh, movement of a ball in order to help the umpire in decision making or um, Uh, this is um, a microsoft um, home game um, uh, product 
Um, this again uses, it's called Kinect. Um, it uses um, a small camera to track the movement of your body. And there is a, um, another product called Nintendo Wii. So all of these are common day uses of gait analysis, a movement analysis uh, in our daily lives. Um, but move, the history of movement analysis goes back uh, thousands of years. Um, none other than Aristotle uh, was interested in uh, animal movement. And then he actually uh, wrote his first treatise almost 2000 years ago. Um, it's called Dumo to Animalum. Um, and then, but this is Aristotle's drawings, original drawings about how he uh, thought uh, horses galloped. But then um, in the late 19th and early 20th century, when we actually got uh, to take high speed photographs uh, and motion pictures, we found that the way horses galloped is very different to how we thought horses actually galloped. Yeah. So there was, so the human eye was just not able to capture the exact way in which a horse galloped. And only when we started to use technology to analyze the movement of horses, the reality. So all the, uh, um, all the various great artists um, in the Renaissance uh, in Europe, when they painted horses galloping, they actually used Aristotle's um, uh, famous book, uh, but all of them were wrong. So only after um, cameras and mov movie pictures came out, came out, we actually understood how the horses actually galloped. So this points to the inherent weaknesses or inherent limitations and shortcomings of just using our eye to try and analyze movement. So this is the father of modern gait analysis, Dr. Jim Gage. And I had the opportunity to meet him um, 20 years ago. And he inspired my journey into movement analysis and cerebral palsy. And he encountered the same problem that Aristotle encountered, which is without the use of some technology, he found it very difficult to actually describe properly and understand properly how children with cerebral palsy were moving. And that's why he started this whole field of movement analysis. So the human eye is incapable of capturing discrete events at a rate faster than 18 frames per second. This is an absolute processing limit of our brain. There's nothing we can do about it. So, and the child with CP or an athletic athlete who is requiring any orthopedic intervention has problems at multiple levels and in all three planes, namely the coronal, sagittal and transverse plane. And all of these problems are happening at 100 to 250 frames per second. So technology therefore becomes essential to aid in our clinical decision making, just like the umpire on the cricket field. So what is 3D movement analysis? It is basically a test of certain walking parameters. We get objective data such as walking velocity, step length, cadence. We also are able to capture the movements of joints in 3D. This is called kinematics. We are able to measure forces going across each joint. This is called kinetics. We also have EMG probes that are able to capture the electrical activity of muscle. And all of this data is able, we are able to superimpose them in a time bound fashion. So we know what muscle is working at which part of the gait cycle. And using a force plate, we are also able to capture the um, the direction, magnitude, and shape of the ground reaction force vector. So this is a, a picture of our gate lab in Bangalore. So we have 3D infrared cameras. We have um, a high definition 2D camera. We have a force plate on the ground, and we have a very powerful computer which analyzes all this data. So we take a history and do a detailed physical examination of the child. We attach markers to the child's body. And then the patient walks at a self-selected speed on the force platform and the data is automatically captured by the system. So this is a child undergoing gait analysis. You can see the markers on the, on the body. But when we shine light on these markers, they become bright points in space, which the system is able to capture. These uh, bright points in space, the computer then converts it into a 3D biomechanical model from which we get uh, graphs and we'll discuss about these graphs in detail in a minute. So why 3D kinematics? It's because 
perspective matters. So here I have just made a little model stick figure of the leg, and I have rotated it. And as you rotate, the angles change. So uh, the the actual angle of the that figure is not any different. I am just rotating it. So your perspective matters when you are looking at things in two D. But the minute you have a three D gait lab, whichever perspective you look at it from, the the bend and the twist of the leg cannot fool the system, whereas it can fool us if we are watching it with a naked eye or with just two D cameras. So this is a typical uh, gait graph that we get from our system. Um, sorry. So we look at three planes, namely the frontal plane, <clears throat> the sagittal plane, and the transverse plane. These are the three x, y, and z axes. And then we look at the ankle, knee, hip, and pelvis. So we have a total of um, twelve graphs, uh, four levels, and three planes. So let's look at one one such graph. So each graph describes the entire gait cycle, and it describes all the movements that the knee does. In the sagittal plane, so this is knee flexion and extension. So sagittal plane at the knee. So this is the transverse plane or the um, rotation at the hip. Yeah. So this looks at the um, uh, this. So this basically breaks down the movement of the lower limb into x, y, and z axis, and it breaks it down into um, each of the levels. So we have nine graphs of clinical significance, and we have six points of the gait cycle when we are interested, namely initial contact, loading response, mid stance, late stance, initial swing, and terminal swing. So during every second of a person's normal gait, we have 54 events that are captured by the system. So one can understand why it is very difficult to analyze this just by observational gait analysis. Which is why we need a 3D gait analysis system. Just looking at an example of a 10-year-old girl, GMFCS level two, independent walker, diplegic CP, no previous intervention. She's a community walker, comes with a history of frequent falls and awkward gait. So, this is her walking in the in the gait lab. You can clearly see that there is some abnormality in the way in which she is walking. So, based on physical examination. We recommended that she should have stabilization of the foot, release of the left gastrocnemius, bilateral hamstring release, bilateral rectus surgery, and left femoral pterygoidal osteotomy. Total of nine surgeries. But when we analyzed the 3D data, we realized that she needs only six surgeries. Yeah. So through the use of gait analysis, we were able to avoid three unnecessary surgeries, which may actually, if we had done it. It may have caused some harm to the child, or at the very least, we would have performed unnecessary excessive surgery for the child. And this is the same child, one year uh, post-op. You can see that her gait has significantly improved, and she is walking with much um, greater ease and much higher speed. So, so 3D gait analysis helps to decrease the surgical dose or Modify the surgical plan. So we always follow the surgical plan suggested by 3D gait analysis because clinical examination and an intra-op assessment are not as accurate as 3D gait analysis. So indications primarily is children with movement disorders such as cerebral palsy, spina bifida, or any lower motor neuron lesion, uh, residual paralysis. We also look at adults with stroke and Parkinson's disease, and the latest entrant uh, entrant is. Athletes and uh, sports persons. Here we have uh, in Bangalore we have a 3D running analysis lab by which we are able to analyze the running and the um, uh, way the uh, athletes and sports people are moving their limbs during their athletic activity. So this is an example of our 3D running lab. <coughs> we are able to get very detailed biomechanical data about the person, and we are also able to. Uh, give a score uh, about what is the performance of the different uh, parts of their musculoskeletal system, and we can also give them a injury prediction score. So 
This is very advanced technology which is now available in our gate lab in Bangalore, which will be used for useful for athletes and sports persons. So, this is the future of gate analysis. So here we don't need a gate lab at all, and here we have something called inertial measurement units. There are no cameras. The actual measuring device is strapped to the um, limb of the uh, subject. and we can instead of being in a fixed location we can go on field and these ims systems capture data in high speed and real time so we are able, you know so we are moving to the next era of a gate analysis where we don't need a gate lab so and this is a indian product uh, which is being developed we are also helping um, from our bimra gate lab we are doing some of the research and development to try and develop a uh, indigenous uh, low cost um, imu based uh, gate gate analysis technology so every orthopedic department can have its own gate lab which is kept in a little box and whenever any patient needs gate analysis just strap these sensors onto the patient uh, use your mobile phone to capture the video and all the uh, graphs will come up just on your mobile phone so this sort of technology is going to be available in india at an affordable cost in the next 2 or 3 years so this is the future and then we are also moving towards markerless movement analysis just by using simple videos um and no specialized sensors just by capturing the body outline using a software we are able to calculate the relative movement between the segments and using artificial intelligence uh, i think markerless movement technology will be the way forward Where you don't need even an IMU, so this is the final frontier for gate analysis. So there is a lot of evidence uh, in the literature over the last thirty years that doing gate analysis makes a huge difference to orthopedic outcomes, and it improves our outcomes as orthopedic surgeons, and it also stops us from making uh, errors and uh, giving a poor outcome to the uh, children. So gate analysis is not only used in CP. Uh, is used in sports medicine we have gait analysis studies uh, in um, a child in um, individuals with an absent acl after joint replacement and even in um, the field of spine surgery so in summary uh, 3d gait analysis is no longer a research tool that is there only in universities it is an essential part of decision making prior to any orthopedic intervention however minor and the recent advances in gait analysis will make it easy for every orthopedic department throughout the country to have its own gait lab so the time has come for us to learn about adopt and um, utilize this valuable technology in our clinical practice in a decade or less it will be as common as a mri scan so thank you very much uh, for your attention and uh, we are open for questions Is any questions from the postgraduates or from the faculty or an? Please uh, clarify your doubts, sir, because uh, we may not get uh, such a wonderful speaker and knowledgeable persons all the times. All the PGs, any doubts in the examination? Just please uh, feel free to ask, sir. Sir is ready to answer. Sir, uh, uh, really, it was a wonderful uh, gate, uh, a masterly class on the gate, sir. And it is uh, in three parts. First is the normal gate. So, what is the? You have really simplified it. I advise every postgraduate and all the faculty also to go through it again and again because it is there in the Arthur TV. It is recorded. Uh, Arthur TV will be available in Arthur TV link. and then the first that the what are the muscles in action so that is the how you have to analyze i always tell sir our students first you have a concept a, a firm grip on the what is normal always what is normal that's what i tell every my, my student first examine the normal joints that's why that is a, that that similar way you have to analyze the normal gait first what are the phases and sir has clearly given the sub classes everything 
and uh, a beautiful uh, easy to explain i can say it is a very very easy to explain uh, gate analysis then you go to the then uh, the, the abnormal uh, gates that the second part of it uh, sar has shown the all the five groups of the cp which is uh, that is very very important unless you identify the problem you cannot treat it and also third part is the gate trap is a must nowadays because the sar has is what a wonderful term the surgical dose the surgical dose can be reduced and nine surgeries can be uh, come down bring down to uh, maybe five surgeries or six surgeries that's how we can save a lot of things you can see the child who is walking with the jumping gait and how how beautifully she is walking you are just making a change in the one person's life life will change if you do a, a correct uh, a proper scientific uh, procedure and then uh, many of the times it has been asked in the exams so uh, should we mention the gate first or uh, gate in the uh, last sir in the examination you should mention it first sir uh, first sir. so some yeah. uh, some examiners uh, say that it should be mentioned last so it, it goes this way and that way but what uh, i also agree with you sir because we assess the patient the moment patient is entering to your chamber absolutely so that is the why maybe in the exam this way that way but in the in the practice clinical practice always assess the patient the moment he is entering your chamber that is the first idea you will get some analysis most of the times even without you examining the patient uh, you touch the patient you can make a diagnosis that is the a beauty of orthopedics even without you doing the palpation without doing go further go moving and further and further you need not uh, do all the necessary unnecessary tests rather and most of the times you can avoid investigations also unnecessary mri is rather mri has become a, a, a common tool sir nowadays even before mri x ray also people are going for mris so that is not correct you have to have a logical thinking before doing any investigations and also in future i think every medical college will have a gait lab like a simulation lab and a cadaveric labs i think we should have a gait lab to help this say uh, that poor uh, cerebral especially the children cerebral palsy and uh, any any further questions from the uh, faculty sevananda from the faculty there are no questions sir yeah so if there are no more questions uh, and uh, before uh, sevan proposes vote of thanks i would like to immensely thank uh, jain sharma sir yeah, sorry jain <laughs> sampal sir Sampath, sir jain sharma also very familiar to us sir uh, indoor so sir, that's the reason so uh, jain uh, sundar sampal sir and thank you for uh, sparing your valuable time and enlightening our uh, post candidates i am sure that your lecture will definitely help our post candidates again i suggest every post candidate to go through the sars lecture again and again so that you will have a firm concept on the subject and in the exams you will not fumble i always this is the my endeavor is to, sir uh, what i why i am doing all these teaching blog even ioa uh, doing this is we have to pass on your own merits don't depend on the Uh, mercy of your examiners or mercy of your colleagues or mercy of somebody else you i i my aim is to make the student pass on their own merits sir that is the my aim of uh, doing all these uh, weekly programs or whatever programs i am doing sir again thank you so much sir for raising our request at this juncture i would like to thank my student uh, jv kishor who uh, in fact contacted you and arranged our talk sir thank you so much sir now request uh, yeah. before uh, before uh, jain sambha say something uh, uh, so before uh, sevan propose what them so i i request your guidance for the post gate sir your suggestions for the so, post gate sir so gate is uh, very simple actually um, the the problem is with the terminologies so yes, um, what i have done today is just to demystify gate so that it makes the subject more approachable to the post graduate student and make it uh seem uh simple so that when so when you go back and read your book all these terms will not seem foreign and alien uh so because i used to have the same confusion uh, when i was a student uh, and I, you know you always keep the gate chapter 
because yes sir you know i would do the same things that today it is, it is filled <laughs> with the right sir all That's sorts of right. esoteric terms that you think is beyond your understanding but actually it is not they are all just you know very simple terms uh, and just like you know if something is written in sanskrit we cannot understand it so that's all but it is only a mental block so what i have done through my lecture is just to clear that mental block uh, so that students when they read the book yes sir some of some of the concepts i have explained uh, in my talk they will remember so that they will not skip the <laughs> skip the gate pages <laughs> they will yes, actually sir. go back and read but yes. ultimately uh, understanding is not gained by listening to lectures understanding is gained by reading the book yes so sir. what yes. teachers do is just to make the subject approachable so that you can yourself read the book think about it and uh, form your own uh, firm uh, fundamental concepts and in due course you will also i'm sure be teaching students um, once you have grasped uh, all the concepts well so wishing all the post graduates all the very best uh, i would like to thank uh, professor uday kumar professor shivananda and professor sitaram patel uh for this opportunity it's a great interaction um and you know i hope to uh, contribute maybe after some time yes, when sir. our different is there i will contribute definitely we will bother you sometime later sir definitely sure. and then you and uh, one more last question sir do you suggest any specific uh, monogram for the gate sir any book is there just for the sake of the yeah i, I wouldn't yeah there are full textbooks uh, uh you know um jacqueline perry's um no, normal and pathological gait patterns is uh, two and a half thousand page book <laughs> so <laughs> in two volumes so you don't need you don't need that but see, i think if you take any standard orthopedic book and read gait cycle uh that is enough that is enough uh but even those even that one chapter on gait i think many students don't read because the terminology seem very uh, unapproachable it seems complex but it's actually not complex it's very simple yes, you made it very simple today shivanand <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> sir on behalf of nathanandra orthopedic teaching program we are very much thankful sir that you made the gait topic very easy and you have given absolute definition till now most of the surgeons they don't know the absolute definition of the gate but we are very much impressed with the definition of gate that one which you have given them today and you elaborately you have given that uh, 2d gate and 3d gate and markers which are recent advances and for which we are very thankful sir for your wonderful lecture with illustrations and good videos which it can be very easily understandable about cp problems which is very complicated and most of the students cannot understand those uh, gate patterns but you made it very easy and simple sir so we are thankful to you sir and also and with ortho tv ortho tv ashok sham sir uh, for uh, Yes, joining sir. and uh, recording and uh, making recording all this. available for all the postcards uh, thank you ashok sir thank you ashok sham sir thank you sir and, uh, and i think uh, with this few words uh, uh, ashok sham sir thank you so much ashok sir thank you very much <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, once again on behalf of the north andhra pg teaching uh, faculty and then whatsapp pg gurukulam of andhra and from the artho tv also we immensely thank you so much sir jain sir thank you so much thank you thanks to kishore for inviting me <laughs> he was my student in uh, uh, yes, puttaparthi sir 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 yes, sir very thank enthusiastic you, sir, thank I, you, sir. I, i i went there a few times and when kairas rao sir was there sir yes yes a uh, kairas and another uh, one was there sir i forgot his name he used to be there uh, some he left that place now barod sir huh? barod sir valmiki sir valmiki 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 sir yeah valmiki <laughs> so i attend a... i go there once a month now yes sir yes sir yes sir two days um, yes, sir. so i go to some periodic orthopedic surgeries and whatever sir you used to come 
sir used to uh, teach us a, a lot of orthopedic orthopedic cases at the time sir he used to do all the complex cases like uh, uh, degas osteotomies and uh, uh, all the ddh surgeries sir he used to do sir once i went there the dn basis sir sir okay valmik sir was there i was i went there sir anyway, thank you all uh, once again you. for all the faculty and the students all the best way because they are taking their theory in the may 12th sir this month 12th they are appearing for theory most of the exam going student joined here and i wish them all the best and once again i thank uh, jain sambath sir and all the faculty who joined today with the permission with all your permission i am concluding the session today have a happy sunday thank you sir thank you very much bye